Next up on Saturday mornings at your service, it's Welcome to Health. Greatest Grains and the Welcome to Health Center bring you Dr. Kurt Rexroth, chiropractor and clinical nutritionist. Dr. Rexroth is here to answer your questions about chiropractic, nutrition, or healthy weight loss. So give Dr. Rexroth a call at 344-1420, or you can find him online at welcometohealth.com. And now here's Dr. Kurt Rexroth. Good morning, Quad Cities. Great day here in the Quad Cities. Got a lot of interesting things to cover this morning. You know, when I was uh, a student at at Palmer, I thought back on my previous academic career and and I had been teaching at Blackhawk for almost 14 years. I had tenure there. It was a great place to to work. It was a, a, the students were wonderful and things. But you know, I looked back even further and I went back to my academic roots. I have a bachelor's degree and a master's degree before I went to Palmer. But you know what? The toughest program I was ever involved in, and I was involved in the university master's program at Northern Illinois University, but the toughest program I was in was the Palmer curriculum. That was just grueling. It was a professional program. It wasn't an academic program. It was a professional program. It was focused on getting people well. We were working with bones, joints. That's what we studied the whole time. You know, it was a, a program that was focused on how to get people well from musculoskeletal conditions. And I know that's not the only thing that people have problems with, but that was, that was the core. But, you know, interestingly, one of the things that I always did when I was teaching at Palmer, because I taught there for almost 14 years also, um, but one of the things I did while I was teaching there was I wanted to help the students there put their profession in perspective. And um, I would ask them a question. Now, sometime during the, the course of the semester, I would ask them the question, um, who, is, who are the most important healthcare workers available? Well, I mean, who are the most important? If we had to get rid of all the other ones, these are the ones we wanted to keep. And, uh, of course, they would, the first thing they would say was, chiropractors, right? And I would say, nope. And they would kind of back off a little bit and say, medical doctors? I'd say, nope. I'd say, nurses? Nope. Et cetera. We'd go all the way down the list. And very seldom would anybody really guess the right answer. But the right answer is garbage workers and sewage workers. They are responsible for more difference, a big, larger difference in the survivability and the health of the people. I mean, the elimination of infectious diseases, for example, which you know most people in the world credit the medical work, uh, profession with, because I mean, there are some significant advances. Let's face it. Um, you know, antibiotics were an incredible advance in the infectious disease world, and um, you know, although they are way overused and used for totally inappropriate viral illnesses and things like that, they, you know, it's still a significant part. But much bigger than that, much, much bigger is the fact that we don't have cholera and, and typhus and all of these things sweeping through the population on all these waterborne diseases that actually are just have been deadly to large populations of people in epidemics around the world. And who is it that is responsible for that, as well as probably polio and things like this, too? Because polio is a disease that is transmitted largely by feces and other bodily waste as well. The people that are most responsible for all that are the people who carry out our garbage and make sure our sewers are running. So today, what we're going to talk about a little bit is the sewage system of the body. As an analogy, you know, for some of you, you're old enough to think back to the Honeymooners with uh, Art Carney and Jackie Gleason. And Jackie Gleason played the part of a guy who was a bus driver in New York City, you know, and he felt he had so much status and he was just so much better than his friend, um, the sewage worker, you know, Art Carney. And uh, Art was a little, you know, not quite very sophisticated, but but uh, he was actually performing the more important job in that duo. He was helping people move the 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 sewage out of the city, and so that it wasn't transmitting all kinds of disease and causing all kinds of problems. And when you look at this. We have two systems in our body as well. We have a system that feeds the body through the blood. We have a system that removes toxins and removes waste products through what is called the lymphatic system. And when you compare it to your house, for example, 
You bring things in, you bring fluids in, you take fluids out. And when you look at the size of the pipes, what are the pipes? Of course, the first thing is that the pipes that bring water in, they bring water in under pressure. They're very small. And do you ever have water clogs? you ever have water pipes clogging up? I certainly have never heard of it. I'm sure there are instances, but not very often. But what about the sewage pipes? The water pipes are small. The sewage pipes are kind of big. And they drain from gravity, and they drain out, and they, uh, you know, if you get a clog in the sewer, I mean, it's a horrible thing. And how often does that happen? Well, all you need to do is wait long enough, and that will happen. And sometimes you need to, you know, take out a, a little um, a bolt and take out a plug and, you know, run a sewer rat through it or call the the uh, people with the rotor rooter uh, drills, you know, and get those things drilled out, get roots out of your system, et cetera. But those types of things can happen. And even though the system that vents all this garbage, all this sewage out is large, it still has a problem getting clogged up. Well, the body has two systems too. It's got the blood system and it pumps. It's under pressure, just like the water that comes into the house. And you've also got the gravity system, which is, of course, the lymph system. Now, interestingly, the analogy holds true because the lymph system is twice as big as the blood system. Twice as big. And some of those, you know, those pipes are also larger. And so you've got this lymph system throughout the entire body. Now, most of you only are familiar with the lymph system. As a matter of fact, if, as a, if you have a uh, cold or you have an infection of some sort and the lymph glands in your neck swell, that's because not only does the lymph system get the garbage out, but it also is where your immune system is. Now, most of your immune system is in your gut. And why is it there? Because it's trying to protect you before things go wrong. It's trying to help you along with the uh, friendly bacteria in your gut. It's trying to help you deal with problems that might be problems if things get into the blood. So you know, more than 80% of your immune system is in your gut. However, the rest of it is in the lymph system. And this is something that's very important because it's important to understand the lymph, lymph system from this point of view. Most of the time, the lymph system is in a semi-liquid state. At normal body temperature, it's kind of liquid, kind of solid. It's kind of set up so that it's right at that melting point. If you get a fever, the lymph melts. If you get into a cold atmosphere, the lymph does not uh, liquefy and it gels. And it goes back and forth between these two states. So the question is then, why is that melting point so tight on that body temperature mark? Well, it's very simple. For the most part, when you're just kind of maintaining yourself in a normal fashion, you don't need the, the lymph to be totally liquid and, uh, you know, it, it's okay. But if you get sick, if, for example, you get a flu virus, flu viruses replicate at body temperature and below. The, if you go a couple degrees below body temperature, they love it. That's why flu season normally happens when the weather starts getting colder. You start breathing cold air and you wash those throat cells with the cold air that lowers the temperature of those throat cells where the viruses replicate. And the virus, if they're available, go nuts. They commandeer your genetic material in your cell and your DNA, and they start pumping out parts for pro protein parts for viruses. And pretty soon they explode from that cell. They infect all the cells around and they are on their way to making you miserable. But the body has a great defense. And that is this. It sends signals to the brain that says we need heat. And those signals get to the brain and it turns up the thermostat and you start heating up. You start getting extremely hot. You get a fever. And that fever does a wonderful thing for your body. It melts the lymph fluid. It makes it so that immune cells from the lymph fluid can get in and out of the lymphatic fluid very efficiently. It also acts as an incubator for those cells. Namely, it is like the little chicken egg. You take a chicken egg, you put it on the table in your kitchen <clears throat> and uh, let it sit there. What happens? It rots, right? If you put it in the refrigerator, it'll stay for longer. 
But if you put it under a chicken or you put a heat lamp on it, it develops into a chick. Now, the same thing is true with the immune system. If you have a cold immune system, the number of immune cells that can hatch and can, repl- and can uh, reproduce and, and fill the entire environment with these cells that kill viruses, that number stays real low if the environment is cool. But you heat it up. You allow the temperature to get up to 100, 102, 104 degrees even. If it's 104, believe me, you need 104. You need a robust immune response. So don't bring it down. Don't make the mistake of taking that fever down. Now, if it gets up to 105, 106, then you don't want that to be there very long. But it can be there even for a short period of time. But the research tells us that a temperature of 104 is a, still a normal immune response. So leave it be. Let it go. Let the immune system uh, pr- reproduce uh, killer cells and immune cells like crazy and antibodies, those little things that lock onto viruses and prevent them from replicating. Let them produce those antibodies like crazy. Incubate them. Get them hot. Okay? By the way, just as an aside, during that time when you're fighting those infections, your fingernails grow faster, your hair grows faster, everything in your body grows faster. Why? Because you're hot and you're incubating cells. By the way, you're also absolutely miserable. And you want to cover yourself up because you, you, know, you don't want the chills. By the way, what are chills? Chills are a way your body heats itself up. Why? Because it's shaking like crazy and all those muscles are going, and, you're, and, and that's producing heat, just like when you're exercising. That's one of the ways the body ramps up the heat. And it's a, it's a very effective way, and you don't want to, I mean, my gosh, it's just barbaric to put a kid with a 104 fever into a bathtub to try to bring it down. Number one, it doesn't work. The body just works harder. What you want to do is you want to say, ah, oh, this, this child is having a really robust, healthy immune response. Load them with blankets. Cover them up so the body doesn't have to work so hard to take the temperature up. Okay? So the lymph is fluid. The lymph system is incredibly important. And it move, the more it moves, the better it cleans you out. The more toxins are removed from your system. So there's a couple of things you want to do if you're healthy and you're not in a position where your immune system is melting because of fever. It's still good to actually make sure that the lymph fluid is moving through your body and making sure that you're eliminating toxins. We're talking about the garbage scow of the body, the lymphatic system. And we're talking about things that, uh, you know, they're working every day. Now, the medical profession has concentrated and focused on the uh, blood system. And I don't hear much talk about the lymph system unless the person has a complete breakdown of the lymphatic system. And that one of the most horrible breakdowns is called lymphedema, uh, where you actually have um, swelling and you have, what would you say, inflammation of the lymph system. And that is absolutely awful. But a lot of people are on the edge of that, right? Um, the most common cause in the upper extremities, in the top part of the body, is uh, cancer surgeries and things like this. But in the lower part of the body, you get a lot of pooling of blood and fluids be- just because of gravity. And um, lymphedema in the legs and things like that is a horrible condition. And um, some of the things we're talking about today also apply to that. But when you're healthy and you don't have frank lymphedema, it still helps to pay attention to your lymph system. Because if you do have some swelling in the ankles, you can have pitting edema for perhaps, you, you know, when you press on the ankle, the finger that you press in with, the impression stays there. That's a bad sign. That can be, um, that can, you can talk about the um, heart problems with getting the blood from the lower extremities back up to the heart. You know, that's um, um, a, a kind of heart failure because it can't, the blood doesn't come up automatically. It actually has to be, Um, drawn up. And one of the main things, by the way, to do with that is exercise because your muscles push on the blood. But there's a couple of things that probably is a good idea to do, particularly if you have any kind of swelling in the legs. And that is a lymphatic massage. You want to start with your feet, 
push your feet or have somebody else, somebody who loves you, obviously, or you pay for this. You have them squeeze your feet, squeeze the ankles, squeeze the lower calves around the Achilles, squeeze up the leg. It doesn't have to be hard. Just squeeze up and just move that lymph fluid and move that blood that's pulled there up to your knee and then up into your thigh. And then you can contract your thighs. You can stand up and you can contract your thighs and do some exercise and uh, walk. Walking is one of the best things for lymph fluid motion. And you can do this. And if you have swelling in the ankles, I would recommend that you do this and then elevate your feet. In fact, you, well, while they're elevated, you can do the massage. But don't neglect getting up and walking because that all, not only drains lymphatics, it also drains pooled blood. It's just really, really good. If you don't have frank lymphedema but you have swelling in the ankles, don't neglect these techniques because they will actually improve your entire health picture if you do them properly, okay? Now, one of the pe things that people come in with are the compression hose. I'm not particularly a fan of compression hose, the, the uh, tight socks, particularly if they're too tight. And the reason is, is this, that yes, they do push blood and lymph out of the lower extremity, but they also, the pressure on the outside also closes off in other words, if you have a flexible tube and you want to drain that tube, yeah, if you can get a kind of peristaltic action going where you go low and go high and squeeze it up, then you're going to evacuate that tube. But if you put total pressure on that tube and you do it continuously, then frankly, the tube is just closed. There's no circulation there at all. That tube is just plain closed. So it's not really working the way it should work. We don't want to close off those vessels. We want them to fill and to, you know, take the fluid up back up to the heart with the blood or back up into the colon and drainage system with the lymphatic system and get that, um, those toxins and all that oils, waste products out of your system. So I, I'm not a big fan of compression uh, stockings. They do have their place. Don't get me wrong. They do have their place. But I think that they're overused. I think more the massage technique and just getting up and exercising is important. But also another thing is breathing. Breathing, you should every day, particularly if you have problems and if you're not involved in a sport or you're not involved in walking, you should take, you know, even set a timer to make sure that you do this. But every day you need to take, you know, 10 really deep breaths and get the oxygen moving, get the lungs moving and get everything in the chest moving because that's important. If you can do some exercise with your arms and things like that, that's also important. Roll your shoulders back and forth, move your head. Don't move your head in a, in a rotary pattern. Just move it forward and backward to the side, turn your head as far as you can, etc., and do all of these different exercises because that's gonna also move lymphatics in your neck, in your upper back, in your shoulders, you know, in the chest, etc. But get those, those things moving. Very, very important. If you have access, um, I'm not sure what the Ys have available now. Hopefully they have infrared, um, far infrared uh, facilities, you know, where you can get in and actually be penetrated with deep penetrating infrared light. But those, that deep penetration of light actually goes deep enough to melt this lymphatic fluid and make it more mobile. So one of the things we have in our clinic, we have um, a um, infrared, um, it's not actually a bed or a, a room, it's just, it looks like you just uh, put yourself into the dryer and your head sticking out. Um, <laughs> so it's kind of a little weird, but it works really, really well. And we have that in our facility and that has the penetrating infrared heat. We also supplement it with near infrared at the same time which gets things going really well. But if you can get that lymphatic fluid moving, then you are just, I mean, you're moving toxins. And in terms of a cleansing program, it's very, very effective. So I would recommend that you find a facility like that, call around, find a facility, and uh, find a place where if you have lymphatic problems, and we deal with those in our clinic too, you know, we, we actually combine the exercise with the massage and the infrared. So uh, it's something that uh, if you, you know, are concerned with that, then you know, come in and we'll talk to you in more in depth.
But the point I'm trying to make here is that even though mostly in the medical world, we ignore this incredibly important system, just like we ignore those magnificent workers who are willing to get out there and uh, make sure that our cities and our homes work by making sure that our sewage systems are um, functioning properly. Those people are magnificent. They are the most important health care workers in our society, bar none. And we, we value them. We also need to value our lymphatic system, the system that moves the toxins out, the system that if we aren't concerned at all with the circulation of that system, then we are missing a huge pet, uh, part of our health. And so I would encourage you to learn more. By the way, there are some great videos on YouTube just on lymphatics. And uh, uh, there are some Ayurv Ayurvedic um, YouTube videos that I think are fantastic. There are some things that just teach you about the immune system. Uh, go to the Internet. I mean, find out about these things for yourself. I encourage you. I mean, I appreciate your listening to this show. But I would uh, point you toward Dr. Mercola on Mercola.com. Uh, and some of these other incredible resources. Uh, Dr. Berg, my gosh, what a teacher that guy is on, on YouTube. Dr. Bergman, the chiropractor who's extremely irrelevant. He's just really funny. But get out there and get some of these things and call the Welcome to Health Center and we can give you more information and we can help you clean up your body. Talk to you next week. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to Welcome to Health with Dr. Kurt Rexroth, part of Saturday Mornings at Your Service, sponsored by the Welcome to Health Center and Greatest Grains. Dr. Rexroth will be back next week at the same time. If you have a question before then, give the good doctor a call at 309-764-2115 or find him online at welcometohealth.com where you can download podcasts of this program, ask questions on the blog, Find out about special events and request an appointment with Dr. Rexroth. And remember, Dr. Rexroth donates his services as a guest speaker to Quad Cities clubs, church groups, and business organizations.